Hello, lovely humans, Jen Foxbot here. In today's episode of Math Mondays, we are continuing our exploration of polarization. Woohoo! Specifically, we are focusing on polarization in atoms because everything that we can see, hear, feel, and touch is made up of atoms. Pretty important for us to understand what's happening with them. So in this video, we are going to look at how to actually calculate how electric fields affect matter. And uh, we will specifically focus on calculating the atomic polarizability, which is basically how much a particular atom, like an element on the periodic table, will respond to an external electric field. Side note, this is physics, so we're going to make some simplistic assumptions, but it's actually a useful model. Very cool. Okay, so quick recap. What the heck is polarization? Basically, polarization happens when you have an electric field that is applied in an area where you have a bunch of charges. The positive charges are going to feel a force in the direction of the electric field, so they'll move in that direction. And the negative charges are going to feel a force opposite to the electric field, so they'll move in that direction. And ultimately, you'll end up with the charges polarized. Basically, the positive charges are going to be on one side, and the uh, negative charges are going to be on the other side. Of course, I'm simplifying here, again, classic physics, um, but that's the gist of it. Okay, so I'm going to grab my handy dandy book and we will read our example problem. A primitive model for an atom consists of a point nucleus with charge positive Q, doo -doo -doo, positive Q, surrounded by a uniformly charged spherical cloud negative Q of radius A. Okay, yeah. This is a spherical cloud with uniform charge of negative Q, and this has a radius of A. Calculate the atomic polarizability of such an atom. Okay, so first, basically what we want to we wanna do is say, what happens in the presence of an external electric field? How is this atom going to respond to that electric field? So let's, uh, let's assume that we apply an electric field E, then uh, we know that this, this um, positively charged nucleus is going to move a distance D. We don't know exactly what it is, but that's okay. Um, so this distance is D. The negative um, spherical cloud is going to be pushed in the opposite direction. We can assume that it stays a sphere which is a reasonable assumption because it turns out it doesn't actually move that much. Um, and then we can ask, okay, uh, well, when does it stop moving and what do we know about it? Well, remember, positive and neg negative charges have a force between them that attracts them together. This is why atoms um, hold together, basically, um, because the negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus. So when the atom stops moving when the nucleus stops moving right, when the electron cloud stops moving left, it means that the force of attraction between the two has balanced out the external electric field. So in other words, in math terms, I guess I should get my white piece of chalk, the external electric field is equal to the internal electric field, which I'm going to write with a little e negative, which stands for the electron. And now we need our equation for the induced dipole moment, which um, if you remember from the intro video, is uh, this is the, the symbol for the dipole moment. Um, and so this equals the atomic polarizability, one of my new favorite words, times the external electric field. Um, so basically how much the electron and the uh, nucleus move, this in induced dipole moment, is proportional uh, to some constant, which depends on the atom and the external applied field. I also want to kind of back up a sec here because we skipped a little bit of topics in electrodynamics. I'm not going to cover all of it. It's a pretty big field of study. Um, so I do want to say that there is a more general equation for dipole moment, which is given by this. Um, like This is the definition of it. Um, so you have uh, 
the charge density and maybe one of space here maybe um and then you okay so this is the equation the definition for dipole moment oh i left a camera view there almost okay so um basically you are summing up the charge over a given distance from the atom um, and then you're summing it up over the entire volume um, fortunately a lot of folks have calculated uh, the dipole moment for a variety of shapes and charge densities so for um, uh, two equal and opposite charges the dipole moment is given um, by q d um, and if we just want to look at the magnitude we can um, get rid of the vector signs. So the magnitude of the dipole moment for equal and opposite charges is uh, just Q times D. Okay, so that's very helpful. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, we also know that the electric field of a uniformly charged sphere at a distance D is given by this equation, one over four pi epsilon naught, um, Q D over a cubed where a is the radius and so um we now can um oh, okay so now we have uh the dipole moment equals alpha times the electric field it also equals q times d so if we can replace q we can then solve for alpha so uh we solve for q with this equation um so we're going to end up with q on one side and we will get four pi epsilon naught a cubed times the electric field divided by D. When we plug it into this equation, the D is gonna cancel. So we are gonna get alpha times the electric field. And again, I'm gonna drop the vector signs because we're looking at magnitudes here. This is a constant, um, doesn't have a direction. So we end up with four pi epsilon naught a cubed, again, the E's are gonna the E's are going to cancel, and then you end up with alpha left over. So we're going to just get rid of those with the handy dandy eraser. Do, 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 do. Okay, so alpha 4 pi epsilon naught times A cubed. Hey, wait a second. The volume of a sphere, <laughs> looks like V naught, um, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Hey, that's basically the volume of a sphere, but we have an extra factor of 3 in there. So we end up with 3 epsilon naught times the volume of the sphere. And this is super duper cool because we can actually use this as a an estimate for some simple atoms so like hydrogen and some of the atoms that are lower on the periodic table and this will be accurate within a factor of four which is really impressive given the super simple model of the atom that we used a spherical cow and whatnot it's kind of the running joke in physics um, if you want to find out what happens to a cow assume a spherical cow so we kind of did that here we made a very simple model but we are within an order of magnitude, which is totally reasonable because this lets us calculate um, some of the things that are going to happen to an atom and make a reasonable approximation and prediction of how that atom is going to react. So cool. Okay, so I'm going to leave it here for now. Um, in the next video, we will look at how much this nucleus actually moves. Turns out it's not a lot but I think it's useful for us to be able to go through that process. Um, so let me know if you have any questions about atomic polarizability. I do wanna make a note that this is one atom. Uh, the situation gets a little more complicated when you have a molecule. It actually depends on the, the geometry of the molecule. Um, so for that, we would need to break down the electric field and the atomic polarizability into its component form. Cool. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions and thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.